Hi everybody. Welcome to a quick introduction of a new concept called Shear Center. We'll be doing some numerical examples together as a class, but this is your conceptual introduction. So we've already talked about thin-walled members, uh, I-beams or thin-walled members. But now we want to talk about what happens if you have a thin-walled member without a vertical axis of symmetry. So the image we have here, if we drew a vertical axis through centroid, we see it is the same on the left and the right side, and when we load that, the beam bends down like a diving board. But what happens if we rotate the shape 90 degrees, and now we look at our vertical axes and we're not the same on the left and the right? If we were to come back in and load that, what happens is not only do we bend down like a diving board, but the whole thing rotates. We twist as if a torsion was applied. That's not okay. So what's happening, right? So Literally, right, here's our original behavior. We've put this load, we're acting through the centroid, but this is what it behaves like, as if we actually put a torsion on here. And so we have to go, well, how could we fix this? What might we do? And it turns out there's a point called the shear center. And if we loaded this through the shear center, we could counteract and cause an opposing moment. So members, that do not have a vertical axis of symmetry have what's called a shear center. And it is a point that if we were to load it through that point, we could actually offset that unexpected twisting that comes from not having a symmetric cross section. So how would we find that E value? Well, here's big picture. We know what shear flow is, right? We're familiar with shear flow. We've already found that. That is our little Q and it's equal to VQ over I. And when we find it in the top and bottom flange, because our area doesn't have vary with the height, it's varying left to right as we're finding our big Q, then our shear flow is linear in the top and bottom flange. Still parabolic in the, in the web, but it's linear in the top and bottom flange, it makes it very easy to sum up. We could just find the magnitude at B, it's zero at A, and then find basically a triangular area based on the magnitude at B. And so we could sum those up and find the forces F and F prime, all right? And so those are just a summation of forces. That V that we put there is equal to the applied shear because the shear in the web or the shear flow in the web does have to sum up to equal the total shear that's applied. Now, I want you to notice something. Those two forces at the top and bottom flange are equal and opposite and they form a couple that causes rotation. Now these are the resultants. We also have internal equal and opposite on the other side that are causing the rotation that's of concern. But if we could just take that V and push it out so that it's acting at a distance to counteract the couple, we could literally find the E value as nothing more than V times E had better equal the force couple or force times H. So that's just big picture how shear center works, but why? Why would we ever have a shape that doesn't have vertical symmetry if we know it causes problems? Well, let me show you a really common and great use of a C channel. Stair stringers. What is the stair stringer? Well, if we look in a little closer, this is the stair stringer. It carries the treads, the part we walk on, and we can see the top and bottom flanges of the channel there in the picture. And if we look on the right side, we just see the black back wall of the channel. And to get a schematic of what this looks like, basically there are tabs that are welded onto the back side, and then the stair tread comes and lands on and loads right through the shear center. In fact, here's some being manufactured, so you can see where the tabs are being welded onto the face. And if you look closely, you can actually see the top and bottom flanges of our channels so that we see it is still this uh, shape that doesn't have a vertical axis symmetry. Now, what if you didn't use a C-channel? So on the left, we have a stair set with a C-channel, and we literally just have the stability coming from the channels themselves for the stringers and the stair treads just spanning in between, like we saw in the first example. 
But in our second case, we have flat rectangular steel, almost like you took sheet metal, thick sheet metal, and cut out these long rectangular strips for our stringers. And when we look at our loading schematic here, we now have a rectangular shape, and then our loading though is still off to the side. And so the equivalent load system, because the load wants to act through the centroid of an axisymmetric shape, so this is symmetric about its vertical axes, we actually are imparting a moment that now we have to deal with. And so what we can see is the way that they stabilize the system is now the entire stair is stability. And you could almost consider that the stringers are flanges and the middle pieces that they've had to weld on and attach to carry each tread almost act like a web to give us stability. So you can see the difference between using an axisymmetric member or this member that isn't axisymmetric is then perfectly suited for something like a clean stair tread because we can take advantage of the twist and put our load out at the shear center so that it stays stable but without having to have extra steel. So that's your intro to shear center. Again, we will solve numerical problems when we get together in the class. Thanks for watching.